My name is Carly Graham Garcia. I manage external affairs for Google's campus in New York City. Thank you for coming to Google today for this discussion. Um, we are pleased to partner with ABNY, the Association for a Better New York, to discuss the changing the face of engineering with three very esteemed deans. I want to briefly introduce them as well as our moderator. Um, with us, we have NYU Tandon School of Engineering Dean Yelena Kavakovich, Columbia Fu Few Schools of Engineering Dean Mary Cunningham Boyce, and also City College's Grove School of Engineering Dean Gilda Barbarina. Um, moderating today's discussion will be Google's uh, Chief Information Officer and Co-Site Lead at Google New York City, Ben Freed. At the end of the discussion, we are going to be passing around mics so we can hear your questions. Enjoy the discussion. Thanks, Carly. Um, so welcome, welcome to all of you, and welcome to the three of you. Uh, we are privileged uh, to host this panel here today of such uh, accomplished and amazingly talented individuals. I, I should add, in the spirit of disclosing one's uh, potential biases, I should add that uh, I am a graduate of Columbia University, and I sit on the Board of Visitors of Columbia Engineering, so I, Mary and I go back a bit. Um, and I have a ton of uh, school pride seeing her here today. Uh, but I also do my, do my best to be balanced and serve in my role as moderator uh, as well as possible. Um, so anyway, we're honored to welcome you here to Google, to the New York City, Google's New York City campus, where we now have, there's more than 8,000 employees seated here in three buildings. And if you go to the western windows of this building, you can look on Pier 57 and see uh, our next building on 15th Street. I should also add, uh, as a lifelong New Yorker, I'm very proud of the fact that Google New York is our largest office outside of the Bay Area, and in our employee engagement surveys is routinely rated as the happiest or one of the happiest. Of course, <laughs> for New York, I expect no less. <laughs> so let me dive into the questions now, and I thought I'd lead with one to try to frame things for our, our panelists and the audience, which is that, um, for, for each one of you, what is your view on what the role of an engineering school is in society? What, 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 what space does it or should it occupy? What are its obligations to society? What is its engagement with the world outside of the walls of academia? And does being in New York uh, influence that in some way, create new opportunity, uh, new obligation? Uh, what are your thoughts? I guess, should we start closest to me and... Sure. Uh, just to, to disclose, I'm also a graduate of Columbia, so I'm very proud <laughs> that Mary's here. Roar, lion, roar. I'm not a lifelong New Yorker, but I've been here for 30 plus years, so I'm very proud of what's happening in New York. Um, I would say that uh, what's really interesting is that technology is everywhere, right, today. New York is, is a center and has always been a center of, of business and, and finance and fashion and, and health and so on. And today, these, these businesses are increasingly becoming technology businesses. So the engineering is permeating any or all areas of our lives. And so what I think we all collectively want to do, and, and we phrase it perhaps different ways, but it, it's the same idea, it's re we really want uh, to make a positive societal impact. Uh, we live in, in New York City, uh, the greatest city in the world, um, which is its own urban idea lab. You can, it, it's a test bed for many things that we want to do. So I, I, I would say in one short sentence, we want our kids to go out there and to have this entrepreneurial spirit to look at the world around them and figure out what is it that they as engineers can change. And if you look at the 17 societal uh, global challenges, in each one of them, technology has a role. So, so I would add to that, that if you think about engineering as a discipline, engineering is a way of thinking, is a way of doing, is a way of understanding the world. Engineers provide tool sets and solutions to societal problems. And I believe there's a, some of an engineer in all of us. And a place like New York is a great environment to draw that out. I was personally drawn to New York because of the 
opportunities. And I think that that type of thinking just uh, brings not just individuals like myself, but it also brings companies, corporations, it brings other technologists, it brings um, people from all walks of life to a place like New York. Um, and so that's going to continue. It's, it's, it is quite the laboratory, and, and it's a place where we are working on uh, solutions together for the common good. So I see more of that happening in the future. So just to add a few words to this, um, is that I think we're all seeing that engineering is becoming really a foundational degree. Um, that, you know, as, as Gilda was saying, there's an engineer in all of us. But how do we help young people realize there's an engineer in all of us? And that it's a, a critical um, knowledge, a critical foundation for, for any young student to, today uh, to really uh, pursue engineering to see the impact they can have with it. I think one of the great things in New York is that we can see the tangible impact of engineering shaping our lives every day. Um, you know, whether we're talking about construction and transportation or, or telecommunications or medicine, um, even as we're talking about fa fashion and finance. So engineering, technology, this is reshaping all of these fields. And to have that foundational degree is so important for young people today. Um, liberal arts, of course, we all understand the importance of that as a foundational degree. But now engineering also is foundational. So how do we encourage young people to be pursuing this? We have fantastic engineering schools across New York City. New York City itself is a living laboratory uh, that we, when we can make an impact here, as the saying goes, we can do it anywhere. Uh, New York has its challenges, um, and we can, can rise to meet those challenges with really creative engineering solutions. So also getting out the fact that engineering is creative, a very creative discipline. Uh, and I think young people today want to exercise their creativity, uh, but also want to bring that impact on human lives. And, I, I, th and now that's really something that can be seen and felt uh, very broadly. So, uh, so this is really our moment. I think it's a New York moment as well to really uh, bring an engineering element much more broadly to the city. And this also gets that out because New York itself is so visible. If we're able to really make that communication of the visibility and the impact of engineering across uh, so many areas of, of uh, improving human lives, that it goes outside of New York. So that we're actually in a great uh, moment for this to be a platform for engineering. I have to kind of go off script a little bit here and mention that you talked about uh, the city as a lab and the opportunity of local impact. And Mary, I saw your 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 name and face in the New York Times back in January in conjunction with Governor Cuomo's efforts to come up with a speedier solution to the L train tunnel uh, <laughs> problem, which I don't know about this audience, but I know my colleagues at Google were on uh, pins and needles about that. So is, is that... Uh, should we take that as an example of what engaged engineering in the laboratory of the city can do? And what, was that something that will breed more such opportunities? Uh, I think absolutely. Um, I th think we have so much opportunity to bring in real impact to, to everyday lives today. Right. We also, of course, are are committed to those, you know, next generation um, solutions. But even today, there's so there's so much we can be doing and and to create innovative solutions to very pressing challenges. Um, the L train was kind of a, an a off script <laughs> set, set moment, but really one where uh, we could very much engage with the with the city with. The, crucial transportation system of, of thinking that over 250,000 people are traveling that tunnel every day. And if that tunnel were to be shut down for 15 months, 18 months, those 250,000 people were going to spill over to other transportation systems. So the lives impacted is, uh, was it's really enormous. And could we come in and, and work uh, with the engineering consultants, with the MTA, 
this was an incredibly collaborative effort. So it was not confrontational, it was collaborative. So how, how universities can collaborate with the city, uh, with, with corporations in the city, I, I think you know, this is something that is more instinctual for engineers to want to be part of, of the world. Oh, please. If, yeah. I, if I may give another really, which I think is a great example. So um, at uh, NYU Tandon School of Engineering, we have a Center for Urban Science and Progress. And um, one of the interesting projects is called Sonic, Sounds of New York City. So all of you uh, know or will probably guess that uh, noise is one of the topmost complaints for quality of life, especially in this city with all the construction, everything that's going on. Since 311 was introduced, the top complaint is noise. So 2.7 million complaints are noise related. And so the, and you know, I remember myself when we had people in the commercial space under my apartment working at 11 at night and like a crazy person, I would go in the bathrobe to try to, you know, to, to ask them to stop, you know, working so we can sleep. And what they're doing is they're creating a whole internet of things set of sensors that would really gather information about the noise in a, a objective way because when the inspector comes, Perhaps the noisy person is not noisy anymore, or you know you can't really quantify the amount of noise. Working with both government agencies and city agencies, and not for profits, but also with the citizen scientists. So if you go on their website, you uh, you can become a citizen scientist, and you can kind of annotate uh, levels and sources of noise. So it's another great example how the city is really a lab around us where we can do something constructive to improve the lives of all of us. And I, just to add to that, when we look, um, we're doing some really innovative things. So the, th the three universities here together, uh, and also in collaboration with Rutgers University and the city of New York, uh, actually have constructed a literally living laboratory up, up between um, the Morningside Columbia campus and our Manhattanville campus and, and City College of, of New York. Uh, this has become an advanced wireless lab so for 5G and beyond, our rooftops are being instrumented, our light poles are being instrumented, the Columbia vehicles are being instrumented. Um, so this is in, in collaboration with the city um, and sponsored by NSF as one, is one of two living test beds um, for the country uh, so that you can come in and uh, any company here, any university here can partake in exploring and experimenting with what will advanced wireless mean for, for developing autonomous transportation systems or faster medical treatment. So many, many different ways that we can actually uh, use New York. How do we use New York? Um, with all its challenges, but with all of the innovative opportunities to advance these areas. And you, and you can add to this also the educational component, not only, only at our universities, but also through K-12 through centers. So there is an educational Cosmos, the project is called Cosmos, is um, there is an educational toolkit with more than 50 experiments that are given to teachers in middle schools and they're trained so that kids can learn about advanced routing and data analysis. So it, it, it's, it's like a whole vertical line, you know, from educating young kids to our own students to doing research to actually having it be deployed eventually in various areas. Wow. Let me uh, change topics a little bit. So we're hosting this panel uh, during Women's History Month, so which uh, is a time for highlighting and celebrating contributions of women to history and to society. Uh, and recently, one has to note that we've seen these amazing shifts at institutions. Uh, women are now comprise half or near, sometimes more than half, sometimes uh, quite close to it, of the engineering undergraduate student bodies, which is an amazing, amazing, incredible change and accomplishment. Um, and so much of this comes from your work. Uh, what have you been doing? Uh, what can you share with us about what we should learn? Uh, are there, and what were the, the North Stars, the, the kind of the guiding lights in your careers that led to your taking this opportunity and having this, this incredible effect? Ilda, yeah. 
So I think there are a number of things that are happening uh, to account for why we're getting more women entering these fields. One is understanding what the field is and understanding that you can have societal impact by pursuing a degree like engineering, and women are being drawn to that. Um, we, we are concerned, though, that while we are starting to reach parity at the undergraduate level, as we go to higher levels and we go up the ladder to higher level degrees or faculty positions or CEOs of companies, for example, we don't have the same uh, high level of, of representation for women. But if we continue to work at matching up the opportunities and the training and the skill sets, that will start to change. Another thing that's really important is the environments that we're working in. Women want to enter environments that are inclusive, that say you're valued, you belong here. Women want to see role models and others who look like them. And the more that that changes, the more that we'll see increases as well. It's well understood, it's well documented, and it's talked about a lot that we have more diverse teams, more diverse perspectives, we get better solutions, it's just, um, a common sense and a, and a very important way to work. So that combination, again, of, of understanding what you can do with a degree like engineering, the societal impact, having role models, having inclusive environments makes a huge difference. Now, in terms of thinking about um, something that stood out to me in my own career, I was reflecting on this for a moment. When I got my PhD in chemical engineering at Rice University in 1986. I was only the fifth African American female to receive a PhD in chemical engineering in the country. And I had the opportunity to meet the first two, and they, they received their PhDs in chemical, chemical engineering, I believe it was like 77 and 78. And one of the things that stood out to me as we think about this, there's usually some pioneer, some role model, some trailblazer who went through a door, opened a door, pushed some boundaries that actually helped those coming behind them. And knowing that, it really does sort of give you a sense of responsibility, your responsibility to open doors for others. And I think more and more women are doing that and taking that responsibility. And interestingly, those women who were before me who got their PhDs in chemical engineering, none of them had uh, pursued like a tenure track position in um, the academy. So when I took my um, position as an assistant professor at Northeastern University in 1989, as far as we knew, I was the first African-American female to enter a tenure track position in chemical engineering. So again, it just says a lot about what we should be doing and how we should have role models and people know about them, create environments where people from different backgrounds can enter, uh, be retained, and succeed. So those are a couple things that I would share. So, so I'd like to go back um, to uh, to the young women entering college today. So we are um, quite fortunate to to see uh, at Columbia, and I know at some of our peers here, uh, our entering class is like forty nine percent women, um, and um, and th this has been uh, for the past couple of years. We're in this like forty. 5, 46, 47, 48 percent women. So really uh, um, achieving parity at our undergraduate level. Let me say this, though. That is not true across the country, okay? And so when we look across the country, that number is less than 20 percent, right? And, um, and so there is a, something magical, um, I think, about uh, how do we attract women? We have to identify women. We have to attract women to this field. Um, and once women, talented women, see other talented women, talented men see talented women, there, it's a snowball effect in a sense that, um, that we feel quite confident that we're going to be able to, to continue that that um, trend here at Columbia. But what we would really like to see is that that happens elsewhere, right? That that spreads out uh, to other universities, um, that when, when we can see women being successful, um, and when the men working side by side with women see women being successful, um, that they're also become our allies and ambassadors when, when they go out into the work field. Um, 
Now, as, as Gilda was saying, there's, there is a pipeline issue. Then, we, then women have to transition into the graduate programs. And then, uh, then you know, so that reduces numbers of women in the graduate programs, yet we're, we still are far above average, um, average uh, numbers at Columbia with over 35% women in our graduate engineering programs. But then we have to transition into, into faculty. Um, and so when women see other women being successful, it's, it really encourages uh, women in these fields. This has to happen in industry too. Industry has to be providing the right type of environment um, that really recognizes and, and supports uh, the success of women. Um, and that it's important to those companies to succeed for them to attract women to these fields. So I, I think there's this is starting to happen. Uh, we think it can happen in New York faster than anywhere else. We um, have collectively, uh, together with other universities across New York, started a um, an effort on New York City Women in Technology, NYC WIT, a uh, nice name, um, and uh, with many corporate partners because corporations understand that for them to be successful, they need to be attracting uh, talented women, talented men uh, to, to these fields in order to, to succeed themselves. So I, I would just add that um, to, to echo the part about women responding to um, societal impact of what we do. Um, and I think for many years, we engineers did a very poor, poor job of selling actually what we do. Um, so people would say, I think this is like an engineer on the train. I went into <laughs> engineering because of math. I love math, I, love, I do modeling, I, I deal with data. Um, that's not the only, of course, path. But another interesting thing is that, that there was a, a survey of, of millennials recently and 81% of them said, that they would like to work in a company that um, has some sort of benefit to society. So it all, all, all ties together. And I think we are doing something special in New York, and it's not an accident. It's not that it just happened. There is a huge amount of work and strategic thinking that, um, that, that's behind this. And thinking about not only how to attract these women, but how to give them support necessary uh, to succeed once in school, and to also change the thinking that perhaps something different is necessary. Uh, you know, everybody knows about uh, the instance or, or the example of how the research on, on heart attacks was mostly done on men, and so the heart attacks in women were missed because the symptoms were different, and until they realized that you cannot do this, and this is not only men and women, you know, it's the you know different ethnic groups and so on. So I think the fact that it's happening in our three schools says something about this city that is really so diverse and so welcoming and so sort of exciting technology-wise that people and women in particular are understanding that they can make a measurable impact by joining one of these fields. So, Gilda, I was really struck by your story. I can't imagine what it would be like to have seen no one in front of you who looked like you, and I, it spurs me to ask for each one of you, as women leading these world-class institutions of higher learning, uh, I mean, it would be great to hear more about challenges, lessons learned. Uh, it's still, I mean, my belief is you are three very unusual people, and I think we would all benefit from hearing uh, what along the way led to you taking these paths and ending up in, well, in these seats right here. So I, there's some traditional things that happen if you're underrepresented in any form or fashion. There's isolation, um, marginalization, um, you know, just lack of community and support. That's just in general. Um, what it did for me, though, it, it made me see that it was even more important to succeed. It's sort of like if you want to make sure that that door is open for someone else who looks like you and shares your background, you need to do well because I, I really felt that if that if I was not successful, they'd say, see, that's why we don't need women or see, that's why we didn't need an African-American. So you have that extra sense of uh, responsibility, but you can use 
these kinds of situations as, as a motivation, or you could use like give up, like what are you gonna do? And my feeling was there are others who went through stuff even more than I did. So it was really important to do that and to be a role model for someone else. So that actually helped. And I will say a couple things for especially the, the women in the audience who are younger. When the opportunity knocks, answer. You know, if the door opens, go through it. And you know, you may not always know the best route to go or where it's going to lead, but we have to take those opportunities. I found that it was very helpful to do things along uh, what's going on with professional societies as well. That's some, something that people don't necessarily think about, but while uh, people are in training or uh, once you become a practitioner, there's a reason why there's professional societies. And we, as the practitioners, are the keepers of our profession. And one way to do that beyond a company or beyond an institution is to participate in the professional society. And they actually can move things faster than like uh, academic institutions. And when I said this business about um, op when an opportunity comes about, um, think about it. I never, ever saw myself as an administrator, not ever. And um, I had an opportunity to serve as a vice provost early in my career, and I did it. And here's one of the things that I found. You can have a lot more impact and influence if you have a seat at the table. And one way to have a seat at the table is to take on a role. It's service, trust me. Um, but to take on a role that puts you in a leadership position, and we need more and more people from different backgrounds to serve in those leadership positions. So I, I urge everyone, if you have those kinds of opportunities, think about it and, and sometimes walk through those doors. I wanted to follow up on something that both of you said. Um, you said you're three unusual women and Gilda said you have to be remarkable. I really want to be in the world where it's okay to have an average woman engineer, right? <laughs> I'm serious, because each one of us is always expected to be so far above the norm so that we can defy the stereotype. That's not the point. And in fact, that proves the stereotype. That proves that to get there, you really have to be far above the norm. There is a, an alum of both our schools, Eleanor Baum, who said, you know, I'm paraphrasing something like the, the bothersome thing about being, you know, the first in something like this, it becomes you know, it's all about women can't. So if she would fail at something, they would say, see, women can do something, right? It, it, it's always when, when you're first in something. I wish, you know, for the girls who are coming in not to have that burden that they have to be really extraordinary in every facet of what they do, because if not, you know, they will be, okay, so that's just, you know, because they're women. So, so I've, I'd like to go maybe a different, different route and just also emphasize there's actually just extreme joy in pursuing engineering. Um, and the, uh, for, for me, how did I get into that? I, no engineers in my family. I'm one of seven children. No engineers in our whole everything. Um, and, but I loved math and physics. And there's nothing wrong with loving math and physics. <laughs> You can still think of that as your your um, your direction, and um, and the sense of the the joy of taking that, putting those together to to create something new. To me, that was what engineering was about, and something I discovered along the way of, of studying. And you know, during my my college years. Uh, I had some very wonderful male professors. I didn't have any female professors um, who really encouraged me, um, who pointed directions for me, said you should be getting a PhD. So I think their mentors come in every shape and size. Pursuing what you love to do is, is really important as well. Um, and just trying to make sure others, yes, People put obstacles up, right? You're the only girl in a class of hundreds. Or, and you, know, you, you could sit and say that's a barrier. But trying to stick with what you really enjoy doing, that there's a creativity to it. So I really encourage um, uh, young, young women to, 
to really understand that there's a, a power in themselves to pursue pursue these things. And there's uh, there's now a whole community, a c cohort, a growing cohort um, that has, as, as Gilda said, opened the doors and. Um, and that has been so important for all of us at different stages in our career, but also just getting understanding that there is just a joy in this field. Um, and then on the sense of deciding on these leadership paths, um, that also for me was, uh, was not something of, of great interest, I should say. <laughs> I really loved just working with my um, students uh, in the lab and in, um, you know, I do both computation and experimental work um, that I just thought that I've got the greatest job in the universe uh, and I'm just going to keep on doing it. Um, and then you realize that at some point um, there's a time where maybe you do have to step up. And, and take that leadership position because you see that your presence, uh, your leadership actually makes a huge difference to others. Um, and, and I have found that to be uh, a remarkable element um, that also gave incredible satisfaction and in how you can really make changes and open, open those doors wider. Um, and, uh, and so it's... It's something that evolves. People don't always plan every moment of their career. I, you know, you see so many people trying to plan out every moment. Uh, some of us just sort of happen into it um, because they're pursuing what they enjoy doing and where they can have an impact. Um, I'd also like to say another kind of little story. I always thought it was my math and physics that was... Um, uh, everything about me in terms of engineering. And it wasn't until actually it was a, a professor <laughs> that one of my fellow professors, um, uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, by the way, so very sort of spatially aware um, <laughs> field, uh, really identified that I was a maker, right? And he asked me, did you sew when you were growing up, right? And it turned out I used to design and sew my own clothes. So I think there are a lot of young maker women out there. I uh, sewed see? as well. Right. That, that, uh, <laughs> that might not even, you didn't, you thought, might have thought the guy in the shop was the engineer. But, you know, the, the young woman who was designing and sewing her own clothes is very much an engineer. So there's many different elements of the engineer in all of us that you might not even think of as the engineer in you. So I, there's a lot of different ingredients that come together, and you it, you don't have to plan it. You don't have to know that's that that's your direction. Thank you. I, I just I have to pause for a minute, and uh, no, thank you. Those uh, uh, I am just struck by your answers and how each one of you combined a love of the field and a, with uh, an insight in, in, into yourselves. And I think through, th I, you were all very self-effacing, but uh, I could feel the leadership, which maybe has emerged in you, but which is clearly <laughs> present in you. So th those were uh, striking answers beyond what I expected at the time I asked the question. So thank you, thank you for that. L let me let me change topics a little bit. But as leaders of engineering schools, I think all three of you mentioned the role of technology in fashioning kind of the opportunity for engineering and the in some cases the attraction of new students to engineering and and the role of engineering schools to influence the city and society. And you know, as someone. And one of the things I love about computer science, for example, is how quickly it's moving. But I wonder, one of the things I worry about as, as leaders of academic institutions, how do you balance uh, kind of keeping up with the realities of the what, what's necessary for students to be employable in industry? Because you, you all spoke about the importance of that connection with industry. How do you, but in, in these very fast changing disciplines, how do you balance that desire and that need to keep up with what industry demands and to create truly employable students with not letting your universities be accused of becoming trade schools and with making sure that you're teaching the eternals of engineering as well? Because there must be enormous pressure on keeping up with the flavors of, certainly in computer science, with keeping up with the flavors of what's important and exciting today. 
So I'll start. I, I, this is a really good question, and, and this is something that we all think about uh, a lot. So I think, you know, because we are saying, we are all saying we want our students to go out there and really change the world, but to address things that are societally relevant. And that means having an insight and understanding and thoughtfulness to look at the world around you and not only in a purely technical way, but understanding what happens before that and after that, right? Um, one thing is to think how to upskill your students or your employees and so on, and, and academics are uh, your typical lifelong learners. All of us throughout our academic careers have had to kind of switch at least fields somewhat and learn something completely from scratch. I moved from communications to biomedical imaging and last time before that I had biology was in sixth grade. So I took the freshman book at Carnegie Mellon and I stood just on biology and started reading from page one because you know biology changed so much it had nothing to do with what I was learning. So I think this, this um, this goal of lifelong learning, and so not only learning perhaps a new programming language or the new, you know, you know whatever is the, the latest thing that's on the market, but also giving people a sense of what happens around you. And, you know, today I almost think we don't even have to do it because these kids are so engaged and they're so socially aware that they are demanding more of us. They're demanding more well-rounded education. Yeah, some of them would really like to sit just in front of the computer and, and look at a, and code all day long. But mostly they want to be involved. They want to do other things. They want to be involved on campus and in leadership opportunities and go volunteer and work with kids. So I think it's, you know, it's a two-way street. They are also coming to us and asking us to provide more. And so that becomes part of our educational mission as well. You don't all, almost have to think how to marry the two. You're forced to do it. I, I just add to that that it's a real partnership that's necessary between the academic institutions and the industry, the companies, the corporations, and society at large. So companies and corporations are responding to societal needs and what pressures and what's going on. Institutions are responding and trying to train in a way that the companies get the, the kinds of employees that they're looking for. And as you just heard, that the individuals who are, are especially the, uh, our new student bodies, they're responding, and so they're pushing. Sometimes we are, are responding to what kinds of programming do we need based on what the students are asking for. So it's a combination of the students, the companies, and the academic institutions where you really have to b delicately balance it to, to make sure that you're meeting all those needs and how things are changing, technology is changing. Technology is changing the way we do things. Um, so if you have that kind of collaboration, it really helps. So one structure that has been useful for uh, institutions and companies is to have working like situations, internships or cooperative education opportunities, real world um, opportunities for work experiences while students are still in training. Uh, it's an age old thing where the, the company says, you sent these folks to us and they don't have the right skill sets. And then the institutions say, well, what do you want? And, and, and it's sort of back and forth and not quite what everyone really wants ultimately. And it's certainly not necessarily where the students are going. But if we work at it collaboratively, we can come up with what is the best way. And I think it helps actually if faculty were also having those opportunities to go out in the real world and see what it's like. Because you're training students to go out in a world that you may not have worked in yourself. So if we work collaboratively, we respond to the societal needs and the pressures, how things are actually being used, where technology is taking us, in a collaborative way, we'll all um, end up doing better with it. So, so I'd like to bring us back to remembering that when a student's going to a university, they're going there for a foundational education. They're not being going there to, say, learn a particular um, tool or that um, Google or Amazon or Facebook or, or you know, 
uh, Turner Construction or whomever might want. They're going there for a foundational education that is going to serve their life, right? That, um, and this is the, across their liberal arts and across engineering. As I said before, engineering is now a foundational education. So we as university um, academicians really need to be committed to, to that is our mission uh, for our students. It's to prepare them to succeed for life, not for the very first month on a job, right? They'll be able to pick up those tools uh, pretty quickly. Summer interns, are, internships are a great uh, place for that. Uh, our students today also are highly involved in all of these extracurricular activities. We do design challenges. We have engineers without borders. They may be in a dance club, right? They're picking up all sorts of other skills. We call it, you know, it's not just the Columbia education, it's the Columbia experience. And I'm sure CCNY and NYU have their own way of saying that, that it's important that our students are are capturing and picking up these, these other elements that are needed for them to really understand how to be successful in life. But that foundational education is preparing them for lifelong learning. We know that today things change so rapidly. If we were to design our education to be uh, teaching specific tools, two years from now, it would be different tools. We, we did not do the right thing for our students by focusing on tools. We have to focus on education because this, our students, when educated, they're able to pick up these different tools. Um, so, uh, so even, you know, what's uh, been really striking to me is um, that our students pursuing liberal arts degrees now want something foundational in computer science, right? So we now teach a, a foundational course in computer science for students who are in history or English or political science. And in that course, we're not teaching a tool. Yes, they'll learn how to do some coding, but we're teaching algorithms. We're saying that anyone is smart enough to learn an algorithm, and the algorithm sticks with them for life, right? Um, so it's a way of thinking that we're helping to educate the student on. So trying to figure out how do you bring that other foundational element, a different way of thinking, to students who are across very different interests. And I think that that's our job as, uh, as academicians when we're trying to prepare our students for, for a successful future. Uh, thank you so much. I, I had six or seven more questions, but... Time is, is uh, not agreeing with us here. And I did promise that we'd leave five minutes for qu at least for questions from the audience. I think we have mic runners here who will go. If anyone in the audience has a question, raise your hand and someone will come to you with a mic. These are questions for the panelists, please. Uh, yeah, uh, over here first. Hello, my name is Melvina. I'm a PhD student at Columbia. Um, I have a question about challenges. What are the biggest obstacles you currently face in your leadership positions? And I'm also curious in terms of your biggest um, hopes in terms of what you would like to accomplish uh, during your tenure. Okay, I'll start. I can see everybody is looking around. So I am relatively new. I started last August. Um, I was in another leadership position before that. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge when you start in a new position is to, to kind of take the lay of the land, understand what the strengths are, sort of, people call it SWOT analysis, but sort of figure out really what the strengths of the and weaknesses are and where you can go next and, and set the vision and strategy. So this is exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, I, I, I almost never think of a challenge, you know, I always think it as an opportunity because it's something you can do. And I think this is, this goes well with what you both said about engineering is a way of thinking, right? We thrive on problems. I mean, I would go on vacation with my husband and we would do the, you know, the Mensa puzzles because they're fun. And his brother would look at us and say, aren't you guys on vacation? We said, yeah. We're having fun, right? This is what we do on vacation. So I think, you know, these. Of, of what is it that, that we want these kids to be? And to follow up on what Mary said before, I had the same discussion with a bunch of colleagues this morning, is 
what do you do with these, let's say, undergrads in particular, 18 to 22 year olds? You, you really park them somewhere for four years of their lives until they mature enough to release them into the world, right? So they don't do too much damage. I mean, you know, the brain keeps on maturing until you're 25, it's very true. And so what do you give them? You, yes, you give them some tools because they like to, you know, tackle things and so on, but you really have to equip them for life. So the experience with their peers, with professors, with going to internships and so on, all develops their sense of place in this world and what they can do. And that's what I think all of us are trying to do, how we, explicitly say it, you know, we think of these as critical thinkers and makers of, you know, the 21st century who go into the world. Um, I call them little tandem torches because NYU has the torches, it's, you know, thing. So that go into the world and, and, and look, you know, sort of critically at what's happening and trying to figure out problems. I would say that a challenge is always going to be, no matter what, you're going to have competing needs, competing <laughs> demands, and you're going to want to do it all. You're going to want to do it all well. You're going to be everything to everybody, and that's just not possible. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And as far as what I'd really like to see, like a big hope, really is around um, making sure that all those who want the opportunity to practice as an engineer have the opportunity and have the opportunity to do it in a way that there's some societal impact and there's plenty to be done. So, so I think there's always a lot of different kinds of challenges because you are trying to accomplish so much. Um, I think right now, because we are in New York, uh, the, the uh, ability to attract incredible talent to, to our universities, particularly at Columbia, is, has never been um, better than it is right now. Uh, incredible students, incredible faculty. And then, then for me, the challenge is, how do I provide <laughs> the right atmosphere, the right resources, the right capacity for them to achieve, achieve what they're after. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's, there's always resources is always an issue. How do you allocate those resources? How do you get more resources? How do you have the right kinds of, of laboratories uh, for, for people to thrive in? Uh, so there's, you know, there's the, all the competing factors. It's really, uh, really uh, difficult. We would love to be able to open the door to more and more people, but we're also space constrained. Uh, and and so this is, a, to me, a, uh, maybe a challenge uh, facing, facing different parts of en en engineering. We would love to be able to increase our, our, our student body. Um, but, you know, we're in New York, we have a certain space constraint, and, but we see incredible talent coming, wanting to come to Columbia Engineering. But that's not a cr true across the nation. So, uh, so I just want to give you a startling statistic that across the U.S., um, less than 6%, right? Do I have that number right? Yeah. Six, less than 6% of undergraduate students pursue an engineering degree, okay? If we go to uh, China, for example, that number is, what do you think it is? Someone out there. Mm. It's, it's over 40%, something closer to 50%. So pretty amazing that we... And scary. And scary. Um, where we see we're at a moment right now <laughs> where engineering is literally reshaping almost every aspect of human life, and for the better, all right? Um, of course, we know there's all, all kinds of negative elements that sometimes come along that have to be overcome as time goes on. But, but you know, thinking of water, of energy, of how we connect with each other, of how we're pushing the frontier of medicine, and to, to think we have so much lost opportunity of students not pursuing this area. So in terms of the challenge for engineering, and, and I think put that challenge on us because when you're a, a, a leader in engineering, someone has to be getting that message out there that th there's a, a lost opportunity for so many young people not to be pursuing. At the national theory. level. It's a national issue. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? All right, I'm gonna, not, not seeing anyone saying yes or no, I'm gonna say the answer is yes. Uh, Ma'am, in the, in the front row, and the, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the mic is coming to you. Hi, my name is Bianca White. I'm actually here from um, Con Edison. 
So my question is around communication. Um, was there an opportunity that you can share where you had to change your style of communication or, you know, re refine your style of communication um, dealing with your audience? Do you mean personal style? Personal, um, you know, just women and men communicate differently or receive information differently. So, you know, some examples and lessons learned. I'll, I'll say two things. One is we are all academics and teachers, which means we read our audiences pretty well and we adapt to what the audience needs, right? Um, the second thing I would say is that you need to be who you are. So the things where people tell you, you know, you need to change, uh, you know, the way you dress or smile. or Actually, when I was a Columbia PhD, at some point there was a there was somebody who came to tell us about tips for interviewing. And they said to women in particular, don't wear a perfume because it might be, you know, sort of bothering your interviewer. And, you know, for me, putting a perfume is like dressing up, you know, I would feel naked. And so I said, you know, whatever, you know, I'm going to wear the perfume. If that turns them off, so be it, you know, then, you know, the, what I'm saying is just, you know, your style of communication is your style of communication and it's your strength, no matter what it is. So I don't think you should think of changing it because somebody is telling you, you should be communicating more uh, like someone else. My two cents. So my two cents. I, I absolutely believe in authenticity and being your authentic self is the best way to go. However, that said, <laughs> we have to live in a real world. We have to be practical. I mean, there are times where you bring your authentic self and you might have your authentic self thrown right on out the door. I mean, I think, I, I, yeah, and I think that there are times where, particularly as an African-American woman in this field, I don't have the luxury. I do not have the luxury to say, well, today I'm going to wear my jeans. You know, I mean, it's just a reality. So I make decisions and, and, and decide, like, is it authentic self day or is it, you know? Because <laughs> I'd wear jeans every day if I could. I'd have on jeans now. But uh, I, I really think that we do have to think about the realities and w the positions that we put ourselves in, the messages that we send. We're perceived a certain way. There's stereotypes. And frankly, if you want to move in certain circles, there are times where you have to communicate and present in a certain way. And I am willing to balance that and um, sometimes give up some of my authenticity to make sure that I have a seat at the table so that I can be effective and, you know, go through those open doors or whatever. Okay. So I think you Listen need that combination. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So, so um, I would say, yes, be, be your authentic self as much as possible. Uh, where, where I will say is a, a little bit different is um, that, you know, uh, Yolanda was talking about that we're, we're engineers and we read our audiences. We, we understand how to do that because we're, we're up there in, in front of a lecture hall doing this for, for many years. But that's very different than being a spokesperson for the field. Um, and um, there's a, a sense of, you know, that for someone like me, I really love the more individual interactions with students, with, with research. So having to step up and become a communicator, if you will, is something you have to embrace. Um, and it's, it may not be your natural self. So it may, you can still be your authentic self as a communicator, but it may not be what you were really um, envisioning as, as part of your role. So, so there is some overcoming that of saying, okay, I need to step up because when I step up and communicate, it makes a difference. And, uh, and so really embracing that, I think, is something we've probably all learned to, learned to do um, as we went through our career. I'm sorry, but I believe we're actually in the out of time zone now. Listen, uh, it would be great if uh, we could all give a round of applause for a terrific, terrific panel. <laughs> and let me thank you all again for coming today and for just being incredible here with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you.